God knows the things that you're going through. He knows how you're hurting. You see, He knows just how your heart is broken in two. But He's still the God of the stars and of the sun, and He is your Father. You see, He can calm all your storms and fix it for you, and He'll do it again. He'll do it again. Just take a look at where you are now and where you've been. Has He always come through for you? He's the same as You may not know how, you may not know when, but He'll do it again. You may not know how. No when, no you may not know how, you may not know when, but he'll do it again. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and that's my message. We often think that God's some kind of a, maybe a, a genie in the bottle that says, you know, I'll give you three wishes and that's all you get. And I'm not going to do it again. But God is unlimited in all of his reservoir of heavenly glory and ready to pour out upon us a blessing that we will not be able to contain at all. And he'll do it over and over and over again. I think about this um, uh, story I heard about this guy who was driving. He and another fellow was going down to Florida. And all they were country people. That's all they were. Never been anywhere hardly at all. Now they're making a road trip. They get to Jacksonville, Florida, and they see this sign. All the orange juice you can drink for a dime. Guy looked over at the other and said, stop the car right here. Florida is about to go bankrupt. <laughs> He pulls up to that place. He says, that sign true? All the orange juice you can drink for a dime? She said, it sure is. He said, here's my glass. How about pouring me a glass of orange juice? And she poured it down. He said, I drank it down and it was good. He said, I put the glass back out there and said, I'd like to have another glass of orange juice, please. And she said, that'll be another dime. <laughs> he said, what you mean here? The sign says all the orange juice you can drink for a dime. And she said, well, you had one glass, and that's all you can drink for a dime. <laughs> you got to watch them, don't you? you got to watch those signs. Well, you know, that is the way we sometimes feel about God. We come to God and say, God, I know you healed me, but will you do it again? And we question, will God do it again? And all through the Word you find that He does, but we somehow or another, we doubt. Now, here was the devotion. I was reading in Matthew uh, chapter 15, and you understand, several weeks ago, I administered on God feeding the 5,000. Where are we going to get it? Where are we going to get the food? The disciples, where are we going to get food enough to feed all these men, 5,000 men besides the women and children, which possibly could be 10,000 people? And then one says, well, you know, I got seven. I got uh, these, uh, a few fish and five loaves of bread. And Jesus said, let me have it. And he blessed it, gave it to the disciples. They break it and goes and gives it to all of those people. And can you remember how many baskets fulls was left over? Twelve baskets full of food left over. More, more, more than what they started off with. And that God is always more than enough. He's always more than enough. Don't ever hesitate to ask God for big when you're calling upon him because he doesn't have to deal in the small little things. It's not a matter of, Lord, oh, Lord, just help me feel better. Well, an aspirin can help me feel, feel better. I don't want to just feel better. I want to be healed from whatever's causing that pain to begin with. 
So ask big. The disciples didn't know how to do that. But now here I'm reading again in the next chapter, chapter 15, and there were 400 or 4,000 men besides the women and children, which possibly could be 8,000 people. And the disciples, the Jesus said, before you send them away because they've been with me for three days, and I really want to make sure they're, they're strong to be able to make the trip back home. And the disciples said, where are we going to get all food to feed all these people? Now they just, in the same book written by Matthew, it's not another uh, view of the feeding of the 5,000. It's a whole new group of people. And the same disciples who saw the multiplication of all that God provided for all these people doubted if God could do it again. Where are we going to get enough food to feed all these people? We only got seven fish and these loaves. How are we going to do it? And I, if I was Jesus, I'd say, hey boys, what happened one chapter ago? What happened last chapter? What did I do? But they couldn't remember. Didn't believe. I mean, you did it once. I don't think you got it in you to do it again. And Jesus proved, said, bring me what you got. And he did. And he fed all of those people. And this time there were seven baskets left over. The disciples finally understood, I believe. Jesus can do it again. Jesus can do it again. Some of you hear testimony after testimony of people being touched by the Lord. And, and you, you think, oh, I wish, I wish God would do that for me, but ah, he doesn't have enough power. He's already done it for somebody else. So somebody else got all the glory and I didn't get any. But I'm glad to hear about it. It was probably uh, in, in Jimmy Swaggart's early, early ministry. He was in the, uh, God had blessed him. And there was this pastor that uh, was reading the testimony of Jimmy Swaggart. And all of a sudden, in the silence of that living room, the wife who was in the kitchen heard him say, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, glory, 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 glory to the Lord. And she comes rushing in. She says, what did he do? What did he do? He says, I read right here for Jimmy Swaggart was blessed with $8,000. And she said, well, you act like he gave it to you. He said, no, I'm praising God because God is no respecter of persons. If he can bless Jimmy Swaggart, he can bless me. And glory, glory, glory be to the Lord. And that's the way it is when you hear a testimony. I believe we hear testimonies so that we can know if God did it then, he can do it now. I never heard anybody being touched or their need met like this. Well, all right, because you heard it, now you've got an idea of how God works and he will do it again. All through the word you find where God does it again and again. Because he is what the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi says, I am the Lord and I change not. What he was is who he is and who he is is what he will always be. God never changing. Think about the blind man in, 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 in Matthew 9 uh, in fact, two of them who said, Oh, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon us and heal our eyes. And Jesus went up to them and said, Be healed. By your faith, you have been healed. And they could see. Wow, praise the Lord. They could see. Blind could see. But now, in Mark's gospel, two other, or another blind man he comes forth and he says, oh, Lord, please do something for me. If you will, you can heal me. What do you want me to heal you of? Blind eyes. And Jesus said to him, I've already done that. So somebody else has already got that blessing. You can't have it. Some of you are getting the Bible out and start reading right now, aren't you? Because <laughs> Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, so be it unto you according to your faith. And the man 
got his eyesight. And you will read of people that came forth with blind eyes over and over again, and he did it again and again and again because God is unlimited. Demon possessed people. Can God deliver more people of demon possession? Sure. But there was a woman who, uh, a Seraphonician. She wasn't of the faith. She wasn't one of the children of God. She wasn't one of Israel's foe. So, as a result, Jesus didn't honor her request to heal her daughter of demon possession. She said, Lord, my, my daughter is vexed with a demon. Please, I know you can cast him out. And Jesus paid her no attention. She kept on. But Lord, I know if you will, you can heal my daughter of this demon possession. Now Jesus responds and says, all the children at my table have the bread of healing and deliverance. It's not right for me to give my children bread and give it to the dogs. Well, you'd think with that insult, she'd storm out and say, well, you, you're not all that much either. But she didn't. She persisted. You know, we don't have any persistence. We, we don't have that, that uh, the guts to be courageous and be strong and continuing on in the faith regardless of whether we receive or not. We keep on in our commitment to the Lord. Because there's some people get mad at God and walk away from Him. This woman didn't get mad. She said, but Lord, even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the children's table. Woo, can't you? I mean, you can feel the heart of Jesus. He had such compassion. He said, go your way because of what you just said. Your daughter is delivered. And she was. Well, then there was other people that had demon possession people. Kids that they wanted Jesus to take care of. One father in Mark said the same thing. Lord, I got my son. He's vexed with the spirit. Throws him into the fire and then tries to drown him. Tries to kill him. Lord, you please come and heal him. Deliver him of that demon. Jesus didn't say, I've already done that. The power to deliver people from demon possession has already been used up. I'm sorry I can't help you. We've not got a God like that. He's a God of unlimited supply. He's more than enough, says his name, El Shaddai. He fills the cup and the cup runs over. That's, that's our witnessing tool. We get so full of what God has for us, we just spill over and start talking about him to people that, well, before we know it, we're witnessing and telling people, this is what Jesus did. This is what Jesus can do. Because you're full. And so Jesus said to the man, your son is delivered, and he was. They brought more demon-possessed people to him, more blind to him, and he healed and he delivered them all. If he did it once, he'll do it again. You got it. Amen. Crippled bodies. There's a great multitude that came to him having great numbers of people who were lame, blind, dumb, maim, and others. And the Bible says in Matthew 15, he healed them all. There was no limit in his power. Again, he did the same thing six chapters later. The blind, the lame, the crippled, the maimed came to him in the temple. And he healed them all. Aren't you glad you serve a God like that? What he did before, he'll do it again. What about the raising of the dead? We capitalize upon uh, John's gospel where he says, and Lazarus, the friend of Jesus, had died. And Jesus comes, and by this time, the body of Lazarus was now decaying and smelling. And Jesus was amidst people that were with him, who learned from him, who knew him, but limited him in his power. 
Because who can raise anybody from the dead? Who can raise anybody from the dead? But they didn't realize that they were talking to the life giver. And Jesus said, roll the stone away from the mouth of the cave. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead came out of that tomb, bound with grave clothes, and was loosed and set free from the power of death. This is the God that we serve. You say, well, I know he did it once. Yeah, he did it once, but he did it again. Because in Luke's gospel, there was a, a, a guy of the temple who came to Jesus, Jairus. My daughter is sick unto death. Would you come and heal her? And we know the story, how that Jesus said, I'll come. And on the way, the daughter died. And when he got there, all the mourners were there crying and weeping. I think they were paid mourners because somehow or another, they switched in a, just like turning off a light or turning a light on. For Jesus said, she's not dead. She's just sleeping right now. And they laughed him to scorn. They went from crying to laughter. Uh, and it wasn't the laughter of joy that she's coming back to life again. It was a laughter of scorning. I don't believe you. You're wrong. You're not right in the head. She's dead and you can do nothing about it. And for that, he said, none of you can come in and see. Only these here that are with me can come in. And then he went in. He took her by the hand, the little 12-year-old girl, and said, little girl, live. And she rose up. And she was totally healed of whatever caused her to die to begin with. So he did a double miracle. He raised her from the dead and healed her body. This is the power of the Lord. We serve. He'll do it again and again. Nature has no power over him. For he said to the storm, when the disciples, remember, he came walking upon the, the shore, or, or walking upon the water, and there was a great storm, and the disciples feared for their life. Peter gets out of the boat and walks. Finally, they both come back to the ship. And Jesus said to the storm, Be still! And there was a great calm. A great calm. And they thought, wow, even nature, even the storms obey him. He did it once. And he did it again. Because Jesus was in the hinder part of the boat asleep another time. And a great storm came. And the disciples feared through the life. And they went down to where Jesus was and said, don't you care about us? We're about to die. Jesus said, fellas, where's your faith? Don't you remember what happened a few days ago? Yeah, but this time I think we're gone. Jesus said, be still. And there was a great calm. That's why he said, fellas, how long am I going to be with you? Oh, you faithless generation, you. Don't you believe that I am the one who will always be able to do what I've done again and again and again? God is an able God. When I was an evangelist um, and I traveled uh, from church to church, you know, I would see, I would see, I'd see miracles. I, there's just something about evangelism of going different places and the Spirit of God moving through you and seeing miracle after miracle. And I didn't leave one revival meeting and think, well, God did this and this and this. I don't know if he'll do it again. But it didn't take me long to find out, yes, what he did in the last revival, expect him to do it this way again and again and again. Oh, just one, for instance, I was in Rock Hill and a woman came in who was in a back brace and had been in a back brace for years. And she, she walked up to the, the, the altar area when, when I was asking for anyone who wanted to be healed. I anointed her with oil, laid hands upon her, and proclaimed healing upon her back. She went back to her seat still with a brace. 
The next night she came and she brought her entire workforce with her and they filled up two pews. And we gave testimonies and she stood and she said, all of my co-workers are here because they've known how my back has been and how there's no operation, there's no help for my back. But I'm not wearing a brace, she said. I'm healed. And she started going all over. And she said, all of my co-workers saw God had healed me and they wanted to know, where did this happen? In other words, we want to see him do it again and again and again. And God began to heal different people and especially those of the back. And then God gave me a word. I don't know if it was there that he gave it to me, but I was, I guess, in my car. And the Lord said, every revival meeting you go into, I am going to heal every back injury, every back problem that you lay your hands upon. And I thought, hallelujah. The first revival I went to, there were back problems. God healed broken backs. He healed the people that were bent over, people that were slumped over, couldn't walk, and all of a sudden they were healed. I thought, hallelujah, this is great. And I went to the next church. I said, God, uh, you're going to do it again. It was not a matter of, are you going to do it again? You're going to do it again. And my faith was of such to where I believed in all of those. And from that day on, I mean, for, for uh, approximately uh, 15 more years of evangelism, every person that had a back problem, every one of them were healed. Uh, and they say, well, well, what about the rest of the body? He did a lot of things there, too. But this was a specific thing that he gave to me, a special healing that he gave to me to, to give to other people. And he did it again and again and again and again. There's nothing too hard for our God. All through the Word you'll find the work is being done. Now, I know Jesus, when He was on the cross, He said, it is finished. And a lot of people say, okay, it's finished. All the miracles and all the blessings are all gone because it's finished. Jesus said, it's done. He went to heaven and took all the blessings back with Him. There's some people believe that. But when He said it's finished, He meant that now all that I have done is so finished that now everybody who will ever live will be having to reap the benefits of all that they see and read about me. This is the God we serve. It is a finished work and we're walking in a finished work. That's why we can say by his stripes we are healed according to Isaiah 55. But then also Peter, he says by his stripes we were healed. It's already done. That's why when I pray for people, I don't necessarily pray God heal them. Lord, let the manifestation of the healing that's already been provided for them now come into their bodies. That they can see it, they can feel it, and know it. Why can I pray that way? Because He will do it again and again and again. I mean, you go into the Old Testament, I, I, I won't go into a lot of detail, but uh, for instance, people's needs. There was a widow who could not feed her, her, her child any more but one more meal. And the prophet of the Lord said, bring me that jar of oil and bring me that little case of flour. He blessed it. And they had all, they, it never went dry. It never was empty. For the whole time of that drought, for three and a half years, she and her family were taken care of because of the supply of the Lord. He did it again to another widow in Bethel. In 2 Kings chapter 4, Elisha, a woman came and said, I need to take care of my family, but I don't have the wherewithal to do it. The prophet said, go and gather up all the vessels you can. I'm thinking to myself, if he said go vessel, get the vessels, I'm not going to get the little mason jars. I'm going to get them. But I'm not going to get that all. I'm going to get your wash tub. How about that 10-gallon wash tub you got? Let me have it. And I believe she brought every vessel she could borrow. And the, the Bible says, Elisha said, take the oil, take that little jar of oil, and start pouring it in two. It was like, it was like a hose pipe. A hose pipe connected to an oil drum. All the oil Every, every, every one of those vessels were completely filled. She said, I have no more. He said, well, all right. And then it stopped. 
He said, now sell the oil and pay off your debt. And she did. And had oil enough to be able to take care of her needs from that point on. This is a God who took care of poverty. Took care of the need. Two times he did it. But of course, you can also say, you know, he did it for me. He did it for me. Because I've heard your testimonies. How that because you tithe, because you give 10% of your gross income, because you do that, God says, I will pour out a blessing upon you, according to Malachi 3.10, that you will not have room enough to contain it. Your needs will be taken care of. And that's what he said. He does it. And he's proved it time and time again. How many of you can say with the uplifted hand, tithing works. Amen. Amen. The parting of the water. We think about the Red Sea. And Moses held up the rod. And the sea parted. And they walked over on dry ground. Did he do it again? Yes, he did. Yes, he did when Joshua had to cross the Jordan River. He put the foot in, the priest put the foot in the, in the water and it divided. And they walked over on dry ground. And say, yeah, but how big was it? I got a little stream in the back of my, my house and it's relatively small. In fact, I could probably put my foot together like that and dam it up for just a little bit. It's small. But this was harvest time at the Jordan River. And at that time, the river was overflowing to where it could be as much as a mile wide. Catch it. A mile wide. Take the Mississippi and multiply it many times over. That's how wide that place was that they were. And he divided it. He divided it one more time. And then you think about mm, Second Kings, the, the, the second chapter. Oh, Elijah, he took, his, he took his mantle off and he smote the waters. And the Bible says the waters divided hither and thither. And they walked over on dry ground. Maybe a day later, here they come, Elijah, Elisha now. He says, if he, God, did it once, he will do it again. And he took his, the mantle that fell from Elijah, and he smote the waters and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And the waters divided hither and thither, and he walked over on dry ground. God did it again and again and again. Jesus Christ, and say it with me, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I can add a hallelujah on the back of that one. We talk about the tongues. People talk about tongues that passed away. Let me tell you what, I'm thankful they're not. I'm thankful we have the Spirit of the Holy Spirit moving in us, that we have being able to praise Him and worship Him and pray to Him in tongues. God did it once for the 120 in the upper room. But he did it again in Cornelius' house when they were speaking and Peter laid hands upon them and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues. Is that all that he did? No. He did it again in Acts chapter 19. As they were speaking, the Holy Spirit, Paul was speaking and the Holy Spirit came upon them and they began to speak in other tongues. In Acts, he says, and this gift is to you, to your children, and to as many as the Lord our God shall call. Thank you, Lord. He did it again. Enoch walked with God. He didn't die. He was raptured. Uh, he was raptured. I say, well, well, that's the first rapture that we know of. Yeah, but he did it again with O Elijah. A whirlwind came, uh, uh, chariots of fire, and he was whisked up to be in the presence of the Lord. He was raptured. He did it again. When Jesus stood there on the mount and all of a sudden he ascended into heaven, he was raptured. Three raptures right there. And then John talks about there is going to be that rapture from Revelation chapter 3 in the middle there. Somewhere there is a rapture because in chapter 4 he is now into the heavenlies. Rapture is going to take place. And we're going to, well, hallelujah, be forever with the Lord. 
but he'll do it again and again and again. In my life, God has proven he'll do it again. In many of yours, with your testimony, he'll do it again. My question to you is, today, do you need a financial help? Somewhere, God's got an oil well in a jar for you. Do you need to know how to, how to get by, how to get going? Do you need a way? Well, God can part the water to make the way for you. Are you in need of a healing? He's still touching people and healing them every day. Every day. How many of you have been touched with the healing power of the Lord in your body? Is that you? Yeah. Yeah. And he'll do it again and again and again. Oh, thank you, Lord. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is impossible with you. Lord, you're able to do exceeding, abundant, above all that we ask or think according to the power of faith that lies within us. Got any rivers you think are uncrossable? Got any mountains you see me can't tunnel through. This is this. God specializes in things thought by man to be impossible. And he will do Specializes in things thought impossible, and he will do what no other power can do. Nothing is too hard with our Lord. 